Welcome to the Chapter 9 review for Algebra 2. This test is over radical functions and expressions and equations where we're solving where there might be radicals. As always, try the problems on your own first. That's the best way to practice and study and prepare for your test. And then watch this recording for the work and explanation and answers for all of the problems. Or you can look at the answer key. Rewrite the radical expression with rational exponents to help simplify. So if you remember, whenever we have a radical expression um, and a rational, to go back and forth between the two. Like say we have the nth root of x to the m power, we could rewrite that as x to the m over n power. Whatever your power is, that's your numerator. Whatever your root is, that's the denominator. And we can go back and forth between these two expressions. So using that idea, let's rewrite each of those. So in the numerator, we have the cube root. So that would be the denominator of our fraction, and m is to the 10th power inside. So we rewrite the numerator as m to the 10 over 3 power. And then, then in the denominator of our fraction, we have m, and that m technically has an exponent of 1. And remember that there is, you know, really a multiplication going on between those two. And that 4 is the root. The 4 goes with the root of m, right? So we would also have a multiplication here where you would have m to the 1 fourth power because this m doesn't really have an exponent, right? It would be to the 1 power just like that one is, but it has the 4 as the root, so that would be its denominator. So that's just rewriting each of those into this form. Now, to simplify this, we're going to use all those different exponent rules that we have. Right? First, if we look at our denominator, to simplify that denominator a little bit, we're multiplying. And when you multiply, you can add your exponents together. So we're going to add 1 plus 1 fourth. Get out a calculator if you need to do that, but definitely make sure that when you do that addition, that you leave it as a fraction. Do not turn it into a mixed number. Do not turn it into a decimal. So if we put it as a fraction, that would be to the 5 fourths. So we have m to the 5 fourths there. The numerator, we haven't done anything with yet. It's still to the 10 thirds power. So now our numerator is just 1m, our denominator is just 1m, and so we can take care of that division part, and when we're dividing, we will subtract our exponents. Remember all those different properties. So if we take 10 over 3 minus 5 over 4, again, feel free, go ahead and get a calculator out to do that subtraction. And again, make sure you write it as a um, improper fraction. And that would be 25 over 12. So our answer equals m to the 25 over 12 power, which is really funky. And you could just leave it like that if you want to. Or if you want to rewrite it in this radical form, the 12 would be the root. So that would go in the little nook thing of our radical. And then the 25 is the power. So m to the 25th power. And that would be our answer for that problem. And then I did want to add here um, that we, you know, if you aren't using a calculator, you know, find a common denominator, 1 plus 1 fourth, 1 is 4 over 4. So now 4 fourths plus 1 fourth, you just add the numerators and that's 5 fourths. And same thing down here, right? The common denominator for 3 and 4 would be 12. So 10 would become 40. You have to multiply both of those by 4. 5 would become 15. Multiply both of those times 3. And then when you subtract, you just subtract the numerators. 40 minus 15 gives us 25. So that's how we got 25 twelfths as our um, final fraction. Now we are going to state the domain and range of the function that's graphed. Um, remember that your domain is your x values and your range is your y values. So really we're just going to look at that graph and figure out, you know, what x values exist and what y values exist. And so for x, um, remember x is your left and right direction. So if we look from left to right, we don't really go anywhere over here on this side, right? So we start at 1, start at 1, and then we go to the right, go to the right, 
And because there's this arrow, we're going to go on to the right forever, right? This arrow is going to keep on going to the right. So that tells us if we start at 1 and we get bigger, that our domain is x is greater than or equal to 1. Right? So there's no ending point for x. It's going to stay at x. It's going to stay at 1 and it's going to keep on going. Um, and because there's this closed circle at 1, that tells us that we do have the equal to. Now, if we look at our range, our range is our um, vertical direction, right, up and down. And if you look up and down here, we have our graph here, but nothing below, nothing at that point, that like end point that we have there. So it's starting there at 2, and it's going to keep on going up. And you're like, okay, it goes up to here. But remember, this arrow tells us that it keeps on going. And it's going more right than it is up, but it is slowly going up. See how it's just trending up? So it's going to keep on going up forever. So our range would be y is greater than or equal to 2. So that point that we have here, this point 1, 2, that's like our end point. So that's where we begin with our x's and it's where we begin with our y's. At the beginning of x is at 1, begin with our y's at 2, and our x's are getting bigger, so it's greater than or equal to 1. Our y's are getting bigger, so that's greater than or equal to 2. Simplify the square root of 75 p to the fourth r to the nth power. So when we do a square root, remember that you're going to be looking for pairs. Um, and you could break apart, you know, 75 into its perfect square factors, but I'm just going to break 75 up, right? It's 3 and 25. 25 is 5 and 5. So if we look there, we have a pair of 5s that can come outside of our square root. But then we also have this little 3 that's all by itself that doesn't have a pair, so it has to stay inside the square root. Right? It's still inside of prison. Right. When we take the square root of this pair of fives, only one five makes it. Only one five makes it out of prison. Um, then if we move on to our p's, p to the fourth means we have one, two, three, four p's. And so we have one pair of p's and another pair of p's. So each pair of p's gets to come out as one. And then when we move on to our r to the ninth, that means that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine R's multiplying together. And so we have one pair of R's, two pair of R's, three pairs of R's, four pairs of R's. So one, two, three, four pairs of R's that get to come out as one, but there is one R that's left over that has to stay underneath our square root. So if we put it all together, we have five P times P, P squared, R times itself four times, so R to the fourth power, times the square root of 3r as our final answer when we simplify that square root. For the next problem, we have simplify the square root of 32 minus the square root of 18 plus the square root of 54 plus the square root of 150. When we add or subtract square roots, um, we do them like like terms. So you have to have like radicals. So if you have the square root of x plus the square root of x, that would equal 2 times the square root of x, right? You can add those two together, but the square root of x plus the square root of y, they're not like radicals, so you can't add them together. Um, so I'm going to look at my first, well, if I look at all my radicals right now, none of them are like. We can't add them together, but we can simplify each of these radicals, right? The square root of 32, if we think about its perfect square factors, um, we have 4 and 8, but we can get even more specific with that, and we can say the square root of 16 and the square root of 2. So the square root of 42, 32 would be 4 square root of 2, right, since you can take the square root of 16 and get 4. And then if we look at the square root of 18, that would be 9 and 2. So we can take the square root of 9, and that's 3, so minus 3 square root of 2. If we look at the square root of 54, that would be the square root of 9 and the square root of 6, right? 54 is 9 times 6. Square root of 9 is 3. Square root of 6 we can't do, right? 6 is just 2 and 3. And then if we look at 50, 150, let's see. Um, this is what I have to do a little bit more thinking through. So I can divide that by 5. I can probably divide it by 25. Yep, if I take 150 divided by 25, which is a perfect square, I have 6. So we can break up the square root of 150 to the square root of 25 and the square root of 6. 
and the square root of 25 is 5, the square root of 6 again we can't do. And now we do have some like terms, right? We can add 4 square root of 2 and negative 3 square root of 2. And if we do that, 4 minus 3 is 1 square root of 2. And then we can do 3 square root of 6 and 5 square root of 6 because they both have a square root of 6. So we add those coefficients and 3 plus 5 is 8. So 8 square root of 6. So our final answer then, we don't need that 1 as a coefficient, is square root of 2 plus 8 square root of 6. If we were to combine all those together. Um, so this isn't something that you can do on a calculator, right? You could check your answer on a calculator. You could plug all of this in in one box and plug our answer in in one box and make sure that their decimals are um, the same. But we can't come up with this answer from our calculator, right? And we're not supposed to round it. When it says simplify it, that doesn't mean that you're going to round your answer. Simplify the square root of um, the quantity x squared plus 16 cubed. So again, just like all of the other problems when you have a square root, you can look for pairs. And x squared plus 16, that quantity is cubed. So that's like looking at x squared plus 16 and multiplying by itself three times. Okay, so you have all three of those underneath our square root. And if we look for our pairs, that means that we can take one of those pairs out. x squared plus 16 can come out of our square root. But then we have one of them left over that has to stay underneath our square root. So that would be our final answer. You have to make sure that you put that first um, quantity x squared plus 16 in parentheses so that you know that the whole thing is multiplying with the square root. Um, what I want to point out there, though, is that um, it is not, oops, it's not equal to if you took the square root of each of these is not equal to the square root of x squared plus the square root of 16, right? According to PEMDAS, um, you would have to do what's inside that square root first. So it's inside the parentheses. You'd have to do that parentheses before you can do the exponent. Write the radical, the fifth root of m cubed using rational exponents. So remember that when you have a radical, whatever, sorry, radical, I'm going to try this. We have a radical and we have an exponent. Whatever number is in this spot here, that's your denominator of your exponent. And whatever number would be your power here, that's your power of your exponent. So those go together. So we notice we have 3, oops, and we have 5. So if we were to rewrite it as an exponent, it would be m to the 3 fifths. So the fifth root of m cubed is the same thing as m to the 3 fifths. So that would be our answer just by rewriting it. Um, another thing I want to point out to you is that the fifth root of m cubed is also the equal to the fifth root of m cubed. So you could do the cubed first and then the fifth root, or you could do the fifth root and then the cubed. I'm just wanting you to see the difference between those notations. But yeah, if we're wanting to rewrite as a rational exponent, that would be our correct answer. Simplify the expression b to the fourth times c to the one half to the one half power, all of that's the one half power, times b cubed times c to the one third. So the first thing we want to do is take care of this power, right? And when you have a power of a power, you can do it to both of those. And um, power of a power, if we remember our exponent rules, you multiply the exponents. So that means that we're going to do b to the fourth, to the fourth power times one half. You're going to multiply those two exponents together. And c to the one half times one half power. And then your um, b cubed and c to the one third, we'll worry about those in a second. So what we would have four times one half is two, so b squared. One half times one half is one fourth, so c to the one fourth power. 
Oops. And now when we move on to the other part, now we are um, multiplying powers. And so when you're multiplying powers, that is when you add your exponents, as long as your bases are the same. So we would do b to the 2 plus 3 power, because you have these two bases that are both b, and you add their exponents, 2 plus 3, and c to the 1 fourth plus 1 third power. Well, b to the 2 plus 3 is 5. c to the 1 fourth plus 1 third, you could get um, a common denominator for those, right? 1 fourth would be the same thing as 3 twelfths, and 1 third would be the same thing as 4 twelfths. So if we add those together, it is 7 twelfths. So we would have b to the fifth, c to the 7 twelfths power when we simplify that all together. And if you want to use an, um, a calculator to add 1 fourth and 1 third, that's perfectly fine to do. Simplify the expression y to the 1 fifth power divided by y to the 3 fourths power. So remember that when you are dividing powers, we subtract their exponents. So we're going to do y to the 1 fifth minus 3 fourths power. And to subtract 1, force, 1 fifth and 3 fourths, we need to find common denominator, right? 1 fifth minus 3 fourths. Um, they have a common de denominator of 20. So we'd have 4 twentieths minus 15 twentieths. So if we do that subtraction, 4 minus 15 is going to give us negative 11 20ths. Okay, this is not pretty, is it? All right, so we would have then y to the negative 11 20ths. But that can't be our final answer because first of all, we're not allowed to have a negative exponent, right? So if we can't have um, a negative exponent, what we need to do is we need to move that to the denominator. So instead of y to the negative 11 20ths, it's 1 over y to the 11 20th. But then that brings up another issue that we cannot have um, fraction exponents in our denominator. So if we can't have fraction exponents, we need to somehow make y to the 11 20th become a whole number exponent like y to the first power. So how can we go from 11 20th to 1? Now if you remember, we are allowed to take our problems like this. And a fraction exponent, remember, is just like um, having a radical. So when we had radicals before, we were able to multiply by like a square root to the top and the bottom. So we're going to multiply by y somehow to the top and the bottom, but not just y, right? Multiply by y to some power. Some number is going to go here. What is that number? Well, remember, we want to get y to the first power. So whatever we multiply y to the 11 20th by, whatever y that happens to be, whatever power we have, it needs to equal y to the first power. And when you multiply powers like that, you add exponents. So we're looking at what can I add with 11 over 20 to get 1? Well, if I Think of that, I need 9 more 20ths to get 1. If I have 11 over 20, I need 9 more of the 20. So that means I'm going to multiply my, numer or my numerator and my denominator by 9 over 20. Y to the 9 over 20th power. Because if I do that, didn't really play in my space well, I would have Y to the 9 over 20 over if I do 11 over 20 plus 9 over 20, that's 20 over 20, which is equal to 1. So this would be y to the first power, or just y. So y to the 9 over 20th power divided by y would be our correct answer there. Um, there's a lot of different things that you have to go through. It's only, mostly just those rules that we can't have a negative exponent, so that moves it to the denominator, and we can't have fraction exponents in the denominator, so we have to rationalize it. So you're really just looking at how many more fractions do I need to get to a whole number. 
what is the correct step in determining the solution of the equation 5z minus 1 to the 1 third power minus 3 equals 1. So we have all these different steps. Which one of these is a correct step? So how about we just go through the problem and think about it. You know, how does it work? Um, one thing to remember is that the 1 third power is the same thing, right? This 1 third is the same thing as a cube root. So just to remind you. Um, so if I'm looking at 5z minus 1 to the 1 third power or the cube root of that, minus 3 equals 1, my first step would be to isolate my cube root. So I would want to add 3 to both sides, and if I add 3 to both sides, that gives me 5z minus 1 to the 1 third power equals 4. Well, it kind of like sort of shows up here, but it's not the exact same, right? They've moved the 1 third power over, so that doesn't work. Okay, so I'm just going to keep on continuing, right? To get rid of a 1 third power, I have to think about What's going to cancel out a one-third power? And a one-third power is the same thing as a cube root. Well, so what's going to cancel out a cube root? And that would be a cube. So I'm going to cube both sides as my next step. And if I cube the cube root, if I cube the cube root, right, those cancel out with each other. And so I'd have 5z minus 1 equals 4 cubed is 4 times 4, which is 16, times another 4, which is 64. Now that does match this answer. So D would be our correct answer. Um, that is one, that is a correct step in determining the solution of that equation. All right, if we look at the other ones here, we already said the cube root's in the wrong spot. Um, the one third power is. Here it looks like they tried to just cube everything kind of, or I'm not sure exactly, they look like they multiplied by three. Here it looks like they kind of cubed everything, but you need to isolate your cube root or your one third power before you do that. Solve the equation 12 plus the square root of 2x minus 1 equals 4. So same idea as before, right? We subtract 12 from both sides to um, isolate our radical. And so we'd have the square root of 2x minus 1 equals 4 minus 12 is negative 8, right? And then um, we would square both sides, right? We'd square 2x minus 1, that's square root and we'd square negative eight. And if we do that, the square root would cancel out. So we have two X minus one equals negative eight squared is 64. And then we would just solve for X, right? Solve for our variable. So I would add one to both sides, two X equals 65. And then I would divide by two x is equal to 65 over 2, right? Or it's equal to 32.5. Now, we always need to make sure that we check our answers, right? Anytime we're solving a radical problem, we need to check our answers. So if I were to get my calculator to make this a little bit faster, I have 12 plus square root of 2 times x, well x we just said is 32.5, right? Yep, and then minus 1, does that equal 4? No, it equals 20. So that doesn't work, right? That doesn't give us the correct answer, right? This doesn't equal 4. So because of that, we're going to say that this isn't an answer. There's actually no solution. And the reason that there is no solution, if you remember, is right here. This little fact right here, you can't have a square root equal to a negative, right? Square roots have to be equal to a positive. If you take the square root of 25, it's 5. If you take the square root of 9, it's 3. So we can't have a square root equal to a negative. So that's why we have no solution. So if you would have caught that right here, you could have stopped and you could have run straight to no solution. But if you don't catch it, you can always plug your back answer, which your answer back in, which you should, and you would notice that it's not going to work. So we get no solution that way too. All right. For the equation, the square root of 3x plus 1 equals the square root of 5x minus 1. The correct solution is x equals 5. Which of the following answers is the extraneous solution found when solving the equation? Tricky, tricky problem. So x equals 5 is the correct solution, but when you solve this problem, you get an extra solution. 
what is that extra solution that actually isn't truly a solution? That's why it's called an extraneous solution. So we actually have to go through and solve it. Um, we can't like just plug those in and check. So when we solve that equation, right, we get one of our square roots by itself, which the square root of 3x plus 1 is already by itself. We square both sides. Make sure you square that whole left side, which means you're going to have to foil. You're going to have to take the square root of 5x minus 1 times itself twice. And they're binomial, so you have to foil that. So if we square that left side, the square root cancels out, and we have just 3x plus 1. If we square the right side, square root of 5x times the square root of 5x, the square root would cancel out. You have just 5x. Square root of 5x times negative 1 would be negative square root of 5x. And then if we distribute the negative 1, we get negative 1 times the square root of 5x is negative square root of 5x. And negative 1 times negative 1 would be positive 1, right? First, first outer, inner last what you get from multiplying so now if we were to combine our like terms we would have 5x minus 2 times the square root of 5x plus 1 on the right well we still have a radical right so we need to isolate this radical now we got rid of the one now we need to get rid of the other one so we're going to subtract the one over and subtract the 5x over Right. And if we do that, 3x minus 5x is negative 2x. 1 minus 1, that's gone. Hey, that makes it a little bit easier on us. Equals negative 2 times the square root of 5x, right? Because the 5x's are gone, the 1 is gone. Um, you have two options here. You could divide by negative 2 because if we do that, we can easily divide it from the other left side. But if negative 2 didn't divide e e ugh, easily <laughs> from the left side, um, then you could technically leave it where it is. So I just wanted to point that out to you. Negative 2x divided by negative 2 just gives us x. So we have x equals the square root of 5x. And now we're ready to square again, right? Squaring both sides so that we can get rid of that square root on the right side. Um, x squared is x squared. The square root of 5x squared, the square root and the squared cancel out. So we have just 5x. So we have x squared equals 5x. We're left with a quadratic. So when we're solving a quadratic like that, if you remember, we like to get everything on one side equal to 0. So I'm going to subtract that 5x over equal to 0. And the whole point of that is so that we can either you know, factor or use the quadratic formula. And you might look at this and be like, well, this is only two terms. It's not a difference of squares. We, we can't do the x squared plus bx plus c because it's only two terms. It's not three terms. Don't forget that you always have a greatest common factor that you can check for. Not every function has it, but some do. And this one does. They both have an x in common. So you can factor out x, and you have x minus 5 left over. Right? If you take x out of x squared, that gives you x. If you take x away from negative 5x, you have negative 5. And now it is factored, and you can use the zero product property and set each of those equal to zero, right? You would add five on the second one, and so you have x equals zero, and x equals five, right? But five, remember five was the one that was given to us up here. So our extra one, our extraneous solution, is x equals 0, which is answer choice B. So even though 0 is not a solution, you still have to go through all the work to solve for it. So this is a, a way that a problem on the test might be worded so that you actually have to make sure that you do all the work of solving a radical equation, especially one of this form where we have a square root on both sides. And that's the end of the chapter review. If you have any questions, please reach out to me before you attempt the test, and good luck.